Heavenly Father, Almighty God, our King and our God, our King of Kings, you make all things beautiful in your time. Indeed, it's your time, not ours. Sometimes we run ahead of you. We try to do too many things and try to be too smart. But ultimately, Lord, we got to understand that it is your time, not ours. Please help us, dear Lord, to gain some wisdom and knowledge from what we learn today from the Scriptures. And it will be useful in our lives and our testimonies from this day onwards. Amen. Okay, let's begin. Okay. Now let's go to Philippians chapter 2, verse 1. Be of one accord and of one mind. Now let's go to chapter 2, verse 1, page 765, 60 in your KJV Bibles. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, now first you've got to understand if the conditional if is used. That means it's got to say that is there going to be any consolation at all in Jesus? Is there any comfort of love? Is there going to be any fellowship with the Spirit? If any bowels and mercies, uh, now the bowels is not literally bowels. Uh, okay? It means that the inner feeling of love. Fill, fill ye my joy that ye be like-minded. So you see, for Paul to have any of these feelings, he's got to, people have got to be like-minded in the church of the Philippi. Okay? Having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Isn't that wonderful, those two verses? Now let me explain what this Paul mean. People can talk about everything and anything under the sun. But unity in Christ is really the yardstick in which we judge a lot of things. Because a person cannot say, I am a Christian, but I'm outside the unity of Christ. There cannot be such a thing. Because the whole body of Christians are in one body, the body of Christ. People have got to be of the same mind, you know. Now, how do we know that someone is not of the same mind of us? It's what they say. Jesus says, we judge by their words. What the heart keeps, the words will fulfill. The words will come out and show it that what the person really thinks. And this is so important, no? If you really look at it and you all examine the first two lines itself, you can gather a lot of scriptural truths. Because it is the person who is with us will have the same mind and same spirit. It's not a question of, oh, I, I want to do my own thing. I just want to pray by myself. I just want to do this. I don't want to have anything to do with people. And I'm a Christian. Can that be possible? No. Impossible. The person is not in the spirit of Christ. They're in another spirit. Okay? Remember that. That's a crucial thing. So, to know whether a person's a Christian. Now, okay, let's now come to the counter, the counter attack. Those from, let's say, apostate churches will say, oh, you know, the people like Peter Thompson were very divisive. You know, that we are willing to take and batter them for their doctrine. First thing is this, number one. Why should we be united with people who are not in Christ? Now, they claim we are in Christ. No, they are not. They are not. Because to be in Christ, they must have the spirit of truth. So they are not in Christ. We have a right to rebuke, rebuke, reprove. Okay, correct. That's doctrine. Because that's what the Bible tells us to do. That's what we have to do. Purity in Christ. So when they claim, the counterclaim that, oh yeah, we are not Christian, you know, like, you are Pharisees and all that. I was just reading Charismatic Chaos just now. The book. And you know what the best part? Charismatics and all Pentecostals like to say this. They like to say that those like John MacArthur, those let's say like Paul Washer, we are all false Christians. We are the ones. Who, and we are the ones who are wrong because we are challenging them on their doctrine. They said, how can you do this? Shouldn't we have unity? Now ask yourself, be honest, are all of you, who do you think would come up with such a devious, cunning lie in order to ensure that the truth is not established? Satan. Part of lies. So, the question is, is, if they are willing to twist it for their doctrine, then who do you think they are really serving? Satan. Logic, right? It's logic, Christian logic. Can they be serving Christ? How can, okay, let's say, our doctrine is diametrically opposed to, let's say, Coos, or City Circus Housing Cash, or FCBC. How can we say that our doctrine, we are all the brothers and sisters in Christ, when they don't agree with us? 
Now, the question here is this, okay? How then are we to know that we are on the right one? Someone asked me this question. How then can we know we are right? Easy. Because we have the Bible with us. That separates it. They don't. Now, some will say, no, no, but they do. They do take the Bible out on Sunday in church. No, no, no. Number one, they probably use NIV, like Coos. Number two, even if they use KJV, like some Baptist churches, they are twisting scriptures for their own name because it doesn't really say that. They'll take it out of context and we can prove it. That's why if you see those of us who have been coming down daily for prayers, you know this why, especially like Joshua has been coming down every day this week. How many things have we seen, right, in the scriptures from Matthew, from Psalms and all that? We know we are on stronger ground. Now, if they are not united with us, they are saying that we should be united with them. So let's say for the sake, okay, we just take it, take aside, huh? put bias aside. Must I say to Chantel, okay, for sake of unity, I will go to church, I will follow your false doctrine, but I, that's called being Christian. How does that happen? So, so we must be united with these people. Now, first thing is, if she's a real Christian, I, 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 then I'm wrong. I'm wrong. But she's not. They are not. Neither is Kyle. Because now they have to lie in order to make themselves look good. So we don't have to agree with them. When they say about unity in Christ, it's unity in spirit and one mind. But if there is a division, they create it. Because they're not in the Lord. So we're not to be united and the Bible says we should not be yoked with the hidden. They're also hidden. They are hidden. Yes, they are. By the way, I wish sometimes that you all can really look at it. There are lots of books, it's not just two, okay? Uh, if you want, I can also get your T. Anderson's book on called Bondage Breaker. You will find that churches that are Pentecostal have the highest demonism rate among all mainstream Christian churches. Pentecostal churches have the highest demon rate. Highest demon rate. T. Anderson has done it. He sees ministry who drives out demons. They are the ones who are at the forefront of driving out demons. And they find it's not the Bible-believing churches. They will never have demon-possessed people. Never. Would you believe... The highest rate of demon possession is Pentecostal churches. I'm not surprised. So how can they be the ones in the right spirit? They have the most demonized people. Go read that book. Okay? If you want, I can hand it to you guys. Let's go to three. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem other better than themselves. We should always think of others other than ourselves. We shouldn't put people down in the church. We shouldn't. That's wrong. Okay? We shouldn't glory ourselves as thinking we are better Christians. Okay? And by the way, they said, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. It's not about turning to ourselves. Look at the Benny Hins, the Didi Drakes. You notice they always say the Benny Hinn ministry. Isn't it should be God's truth ministry? Shouldn't the focus be on God? Why is it Benny Hinn ministry? You, you get the point that the Bible is trying to say. And by the way, it's not through strife. Let's understand the strife part. Okay? The, the people like all those so-called Christians, they will say, we are the ones causing the strife. They will claim we are the ones breaking the friendships. No, but what are we supposed to do? Give up a Lord, denounce the truth just to make them happy? They create the strife by turning away from the truth. They are the creators of the strife. Understand that principle. You're going to be moving on the right line. Now look at Paul. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. We should not just be thinking about ourselves. And being so selfish. You know what I mean? It's not being selfish. We must think of other people also. When they will say about others, they're talking about others in the church. We've got to always have the others in our minds. It's not about wanting to be selfish. If a person says, hey, you know, do this because of me, then already they have a problem. It's a very selfish type of thing. It's not Christianity. It's humanism. That means looking at self. Okay? Now let's look at this. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. You see, the kind of Christ. Now, okay, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. So you see, okay, let's what that means, verse 5. You see, when Christians are really Christians and the Holy Spirit's ministering into us, we start thinking like Christ. Now, go back to the argument, because this is a fundamental debate that we've been having for the last 18 months. Huh? Okay, especially last year it started progressing when Cheng Yi came in. The question is, is, what are we supposed to do? Now, we're supposed to have the mind of Christ. Now, let's say, for example, someone like this guy says, oh, I have the mind of Christ. But would Christ lie? No. 
Now let's give you, she says slaying the spirits in the Bible. So are you supposed to ignore it and pretend that slaying the spirit just to make her happy, to be friends? So are we supposed to be pathological liars, to make pathological liars happy? You get it? Then that's not being the mind of Christ. Christ can't lie. Jesus cannot lie. The Holy Spirit is blameless. The Holy Spirit is sinless. Do they have the Holy Spirit? Not a chance, man. So why must we be united with liars? You get the point? We don't have to be united. For them, it's for them to repent and go to us. No, we go to them. It's the other way around. They are the ones who are telling the lies. Because they cannot have the truth with them. Okay? Now let's go to 6. Who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Now when they talk robbery, of course they are using the Jacobian English. It means that Jesus isn't taking off the title of God by taking anything, stealing anything from God the Father. Because Jesus is God. Jesus is God. Okay? Seven, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Now what does it mean? Jesus was the carpenter's son. It says that in Matthew. Okay? He was the carpenter's son. He came down in a very low estate. Not a family of riches. Although Kongi will dispute that because Kongi is the son of the devil. I don't, I, I don't really believe he fully repented. I really don't. And we got to understand that all these kind of things, Jesus came in a very lowly estate. Very lowly estate. He was a carpenter. And he came in the form of men. Why? To convince us that you can conquer sin as a man. Because why? If the Holy Spirit in you, you can conquer sin. Okay? Now look at you. Hey, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death on the cross. Now when Jesus went to the cross, what did he say to his father? Not my will, but your will be done. He actually, Jesus, you know there was a tremendous pressure on him, okay, when he was in the garden of Gethsemane. Okay, even when he was perspiring, okay, the perspiration was like blood. And by the way, there's a medical condition for that. Some people say that it's a makeup story, there's no such thing. I once read a book, I think about almost 10 years ago. It was an old Christian bookshop that's closed. They asked people, and these are forensic experts, they're talking to people who are in the scientific community. And this person asked one of them, can it be possible? They said if a person's under severe stress, severe stress, a person can sweat blood. So when Jesus was looking down and praying, and blood came down from his perspiration, it's logical. It's not fiction. It can be done. A person under severe stress can sweat blood. So you can understand when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, because Jesus knew he was going to take on the sins of the world, you know. And you know how sad it is? He was sinless, and he's got to take on the infirmities of the world. But he did it, because why? He was a beginner unto death. Nine, wherefore God also have highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name. And believe me, some people may mock him on this. They will mock him now, <laughs> but they'll be worshipping him on the judgment day. They will be in par there will be in paroxysms of terror. Jesus' name is above all the names of the world. Okay? Never forget that point. Okay? And He is the name above every name, and God has exalted him. God the Father has exalted him. And I did this with you, see my notes. Remember in Revelation chapter 5, when Jesus, after he had been slain, he comes before the throne of the Father. And the throne of the Father and God the Father gives him in the right hand the book of the Revelation. So Jesus has been exalted, you know, exalted. We know he's exalted. He's our God. Okay. Now this one I got to explain 10 because he's been misquoted. I hear a lot of people believing they said there will be a great revival and everything he shall allow, every time and confess. No, no, no. It's not in this age. Okay. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of the things in heaven, things in the heaven, the things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, what does it mean? When everything is done at the end of every age, of the age, what will happen is that everybody, whether they like it or not, whether they're on their way to the lake of fire, will have no choice, but they have to say it. Every knee will bow, they have no choice. That's why the Lord says in Revelation, He says to the church, He says, I'll make them who call themselves Jews, bow before you and worship. There's a humiliation down there. Can you imagine all those who rejected Jesus through all the centuries? They have to bow down before Jesus and they have to worship Him. 
before they get burnt. You think about that. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but how much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, I want to say this. This is such an incredible verse. It says this. Not only when Paul is there, but even when he's not there, even more so, they are full of the Spirit, wanting to do the right thing, the Church of Philippi. But one more thing I want to share with you all this. He says this, and all of you need to see this. The concept that we are signing is like signing a blank check. That's why Jude said, some people have taken the grace of God as a license for immorality. Now let me explain what this means. He says you have to work out your salvation. Now let me tell you all this, all of you. The lie that as long as you say a sinner's prayer, as long as you get baptized, as long as you go to church on Sunday, as long as you claim to be a Christian, you're going to see heaven, is a lie. It's a lie. If it was so easy, then where does he say you have to work out? And what does he say? You've got to work out your own salvation, own salvation, with fear and trembling. Now, it's, the Catholics will twist this and say, oh, you have to do good work so you eventually go to heaven. No, no. No, no, no. That's not what we mean. It says in fear and trembling. Why? Do you all think you know the answer? Because when you are in fear and trembling, what do you do? You obey the will of the Father. Got that? Now, question. Are those from Kus, for example, obeying the will of the Father? I was there for a long time. They are not. They are obeying their church doctrine. Same thing with FCBC, same thing with new creation, same thing with all these people. It's the same, ladies and gentlemen, the same. They are not obeying. Do you really think they fear God? Now, I want to ask you a simple question. Be honest. Let's put bias aside. Let's take it objectively. If farm example really feared God, do you think he would say what he says? Not a chance. Now, how about Carl? He says, oh, you can sin. <laughs> He's saying exactly opposite of the Bible. Does he really fear God? If you fear God, okay, now, people can make mistakes. I agree. You can make a translation mistake. It's possible, even John MacArthur says, we can all make mistakes. And he's right, I agree with him. But I'm talking about intent, you know. Now let's give you this example. Elizabeth tells Sky, slay in spirit, it's not the Bible, which is not. She's right. Sky says, oh yeah, I did see it somewhere. Now she feared the Lord, why would she go and say such a thing which is not true and sin against the Holy Spirit? By claiming there's such a thing called slain spirit, which belongs to the Holy Spirit. Do you get what I'm trying to say? Do you notice the point they're trying to say? You've got to be in fear and trembling before the Lord. And that's how you work out your salvation, ladies and gentlemen. You've got to be fear and trembling and you go to the cross and you say, God, please help me, forgive me. And after that, you change. Now, if you find one common denominator, don't believe me, please try. For those who are skeptics, please try. Go ask all these members of all these Pentecostal churches, do you fear the Lord? You know what's the answer? No. None of them fear the Lord. I know it myself because I've asked them. They don't fear the God. You know, they always say about Jesus, oh, he's my friend. Oh, you know, he's full of love. They, they, all the, the so-called goody-goody, the half part of it. They're not talking about the wrath of God. They're not talking about everything else. So it's called a half, half truth. So basically, all these people like Pentecostals, Charismatics, Third Wave, all of them, they don't fear God at all. If they fear God, you know something they will be with trembling when they take the gospel. If they will be trembling when they do the book of Revelation. Because what does Revelation say? You add anything, you die for it. You pay for it. God will add on plagues to you. But they can do whatever they want. Look at Chantal, misrepresenting the one where John falls on the ground uh, in fear. And then she says it's called slain the spirit. She said, oh, I just thought that this. In other words, she took Revelation just as my own interpretation. Now, what does the Bible say? No man should interpret the prophecy as got its own private revelation. Prophecy is by the prophets. That means you interpret prophecy from the Bible itself. She interpreted that book by her own fleshly desires of the mind. Just to prove that there's a slain in the spirit. She twists the doctrine of what's in Revelation just to come up with that conclusion. Now, question. It does not tell fear the Lord. Not a chance. You know when I do Revelation... I'm very scared. I'm very ten I'm in my back of mind. Sometimes I, I tell you the truth. I sometimes don't sleep. I think have I said something wrong? Because when you deal with revelation, you deal with it with fear. She can take revelation and twist it. 
Now people will say it's just an honest mistake. No, 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 wait. If she had fear of the Lord, she wouldn't start that nonsense in the first place. She would not come to that. And if the Holy Spirit was in you know, her, how could she get such a mistake? And you know, if you read the thing in Revelation, the one you saw my response of, I even underlined it. It says clearly, Jesus says, do not fear. He fell because of fear. It's not slain the Spirit. And yet, the words are so clear cut. Even if you use the NIV, uh, the words are quite clear cut. Try it. And yet, she could come to that conclusion. That's wickedness. That's why when she puts the so-called uh, Twitter account with the psalm quoted, she's a hypocrite. Absolute walking hypocrite. Okay. Now, 13 for it is God which worketh in you both to do will and to do of his good pleasure. Okay. You see, when God works in us, what we're supposed to do? His will. Now, sometimes some of you got good energy. I see that in some of you. You try to do good things. But sometimes, as I all tell you, sometimes you got to see through. Is it His will? Are you following what the Bible tells you to do? Are you following the authority, authority, power, structure? Are you doing that? If you're not, then you're not doing God's will. And to do His pleasure. Now, first thing is this. Uh, this is common sense. All of you are old enough. Uh, you're all at least 17. you got enough knowledge. Think very carefully about this. Do you think God wants people to stand in church, falling backwards, calling something called clean the pit, which is not in the Bible, it's witchcraft. Do you think that's his will? No. So, are FCBC members doing the will of God? Not a chance. They're doing in what will? Satan. You see, it comes back to this. By the way, there's no neutrality. Here. Anyone who thinks there's a neutral thing here, I've been in Switzerland too long. It's no true neutrality. It's either for God or the world so they have got the fleshly desires this ecstatic speech but remember that day i showed you the video right joshua it's just you and me remember that one about the modern time right the kundalini spirit right do you know that's exactly what you get in those kind of churches like fcbc it's the kundalini spirit you know, it's the same thing in hinduism you know, you know how scary it is i showed him a video on monday remember that one night about the people falling backwards all that kind of thing guess what same thing as the mystic religions do but when I told Shanta long ago, I said, please go see it and say it for yourself. She never did. Because you know, she's a liar. You see, if she were to search these videos on YouTube and see it, she has to come to two things. Either she's got to deny the videos telling the truth, or she has to admit to herself that, hey, you know, I'm wrong. But she cannot see it, you see. If they were to read books like Demons of the Church, they would be carried. That's why she couldn't see it. She's too intimidated. Because she's under the control of a demonic force. Now, people will say, oh, poor Shanta. No, 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 no. <laughs> Remember what Paul Washer said at the time, the video we saw from our uh, holy desperation. These people bring the judgment of God onto themselves because they have itching ears. You see, they want to feel that ah, I'm filled with the Spirit, so they're zealots. Exactly because they think they're Christian and they want to feel that way. So they can say, I don't have to interpret the Bible, I don't have to spend hours of Bible study, I don't have to underline verses, I don't have to do anything. All I have to do is just go to church on Sunday, of course. Once a week, go to the polytechnic, some kind of talk, one hour, people jabbering nonsense, where we get to socialize, and then after that, I'm going go to heaven. Please, that's what they want to believe. They have got no trembling, they got nothing, and don't follow the word of God. Now, you may say that they follow something, of course. I mean, sometimes I tell you, I'll be a little bit spiritually wise. Think carefully. Can a church present something that's so totally unchristian? No, it has to be doing in stages. If suddenly, Lawrence Kong said, hey, worship Satan. Would they do it? People will. Uh, what? They'll be shocked. It's got to do it in stages. See. You've got to win people's trust first. Like Hillsong. Once you win the prop, the staff say, hey, look, Allah is the same as Jesus. I mean, our God. You see, you've got to do it in stages now. So Lawrence Kong is a minister of who? Satan. He's doing it in stages and he's slowly gravitating to that direction. Pushing it away from the cross. And that's the thing. Be very clear about all this. When you understand the Bible, you really get it. Now, do all things without murmurings and dispute things. We shouldn't be doing things to dispute. If you're doing something dispute, you're doing something wrong. And stop murmuring. Okay, 15. That it may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God. We've got to be blameless and harmless now. Harmless, we shouldn't go around fighting and beating people. At the same time, we must be blameless. Without rebuke, in the midst of the crooked, perverse nation among whom ye shine is light in the world. Now, ladies and gentlemen, ask yourself, 
Are you light into the world? Do you shine as a beacon of hope? Can people look upon you as some beacon of truth? If you don't, you got a problem. You got to shine in a darkened world. The world is so dark. And I'm not talking literal. The Bible is talking about darkness because it's so dark everywhere. What did Jesus say? Behold, okay, the light has come into the world and now comes the judgment that men prefer the darkness from the light. Correct? Because man prefers darkness. Now, let's look at FCBC once again because they're the best example because most of us know the FCBC. Farm is the only deeper person that we know. Okay? But FCBC, we know a few. Okay? A few clowns. Let's look at them. They prefer the darkness. Now, people just say, no, we prefer the light. We prefer the Lord. You know, that we feel the Holy Spirit. First thing is, how can witchcraft be anything logical than Satan? And FCBC is precisely on witchcraft. And it is witchcraft. We can't prove it. You saw right the video on Monday. Uh, Joshua and I saw this video. Okay, we want to show you all later. It is so clear cut. It's satanic. It's so clear cut. It's satanic. And if you look at books like Bondage Breaker, Charismatic Chaos, you look at Demons in the Church. Uh, there's another book by uh, William McGraw. Four altogether. Go read those books and all come to the same conclusion. The phenomenon comes from the devil. So they said, yes, we're Christians, we go on Sunday. No, they prefer the darkness. They prefer the signs and wonders of what? Black magic. Kundalini spirit. Can you imagine when the time comes? And by the way, I was reading Matthew because I read Matthew in the NIV several times. But I'm so glad I'm not reading the KJV because a lot of things were missing. Now I'm starting to get the bigger picture of Jesus' teaching. Do you know what's going to happen to these people? You know that it's better for them not to have gone around saying this. For example, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, what it means? When you blaspheme amongst the Holy Spirit, you're talking about an act of God and claiming it belongs to the devil. Because when Jesus did miracles, it was on God's will. But they said what is driving out demons by Beelzebub. Think carefully, very carefully. If it's a sin for Pharisees to say that a work of God is actually belonging to Satan, then wouldn't it not be blasphemy for them, FCBC members, Kuz and all that, to say a work of Satan, which is black magic, is an act of God? Isn't that blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? Correct. It's doing the same thing. And believe me, there's no way that speaking in tongues of that nature. Now, first thing is, why would God give them the feeling of the Holy Spirit? People who don't cover their hair, who don't care about the Bible, who misquote. So God's going to empower them to the highest spiritual levels? Not a chance. So what's in Chantal's mouth? What is in Yanling or Sky or the cell group leader who is the most possessed? Easy. The demon possessed. The demon possessed. They are already controlled. By the way, as I said, the problem with a lot of people is they don't understand that there are three levels of demon possession. They're not the third level like legion that start raving bonkers. That the first level, remember when Judas, they said Satan entered him at that hour. Judas spoke to Jesus as if he was normal. He even gave Jesus a kiss. So when a person's in a demonic spit rate, they don't have to be start raving bonkers. Second stage is the one like the seven sons of Scarab where the guy is in the middle, he can talk to them, rationalize, but at the same time overpower them because of the spirit in him. The third one of course goes to Legion now where they start raving bonkers, they throw the kid inside the fire, that kind of thing. You got to see the different levels of demon possession. So these people look very normal. They can call in the name of the Lord, but try to test the spirit to them, you see you will not do that. If you don't believe me, right, one day you ask and you try to say this. That Jesus is the Christ who has come in the flesh, who is now who died, is crucified, resurrected, is now seated right here. She can't see it. She can't see it. In the spirit of the Mamma, I did that young young man before, he couldn't do it. So any stumble just like that, any stumble, because they cannot the demon spirit cannot say it. If they say it, they're denying their true nature of rejecting God. So you think of think about it. Okay? Now, look at 16, holding forth the word of life, the word of life, life, the word of God is life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I may not have run in vain, neither labored in vain. Actually, Paul did not run in vain. He brought millions probably to Christ. He, Peter, you know, lots of them like John, they did such a wonderful thing of spreading the truth. Unfortunately, uh, in the 21st century, I was thinking of the day, people have thrown it away. 
If you go to Philippi today, Philippi isn't a Christian place. It's not. It's not a Christian place today. Isn't it so sad? They went all that thing, they put their blood for that. And these churches have become corrupted. Like the church in Sweden. Yea, and I be offered upon the sacrifice of service of your faith. I joy and rejoice with you all. Because you see, it's a rejoicing in us. When we bring a soul to Christ, for the same cause also do ye joy and rejoice with me. You see, it's a unity of spirit. Okay? Timothy's faithful service, but I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy shortly unto you, that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. He wanted to know them, so he wanted to feel good, that they are okay. 20. For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. Okay, except Timothy. For all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. 22. But ye know the proof of him, that as a son with the Father, ye have served with me in the gospel. So Timothy, by the way, is not literal son. A lot of people have speculated, Timothy is not Paul's son. It's just that he sings like a... Okay? So Timothy is a close companion, but obviously much younger than Paul. So Timothy is the one, by the way, the letters of the Timothy, they will come to later. In fact, it's coming quite soon. We will actually look at his letter to Timothy and he'll ask Timothy that, you know, this is what you should do to be a, Christ, a good servant of the Lord. Now let's look at this. Eh? 23. Him therefore I hope to send presently, so soon as I shall see how it will go with me. By trust in the Lord, that I also myself shall come shortly. Now, this is not so important for our edification, but let's know that Paul thought he was going to go back there, but he didn't. He didn't. Actually, Paul had a lot of good intention, but he didn't know how the end would come. Okay, then you'll be sent to Rome. 25. Yet I suppose it necessary to send you Epaphroditus, my brother and companion, labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger, and that he ministered to my wants. Now, do you notice he calls fellow soldier? We are got to be soldiers for Christ. Not carrying arms, not carrying AK-47s or SAR-21s, but when they say soldiers for Christ, we have to have the love of God to fight a good fight of faith. If we see someone talking nonsense, some person claiming to be a Christian talking garbage and misleading others, we should put it correctly in the right state. Okay? Now let's go to this 26. For I long, for he longed after you all, and was full of heaviness because that he had heard that he had been sick. Now you see, they didn't want to make others feel sad. Epaphroditus realized that people were feeling sad in Philippi because he was sick, and he didn't want them to feel sad. Can you imagine the love they got in those days? Today, the first thing they do is say, "Please take a pen all. <laughs> the modern church is so far away from the way the church was in the first century. We are talking about a huge chasm, you know, of difference. Okay, for indeed it was sick nigh unto death, but God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Now Paul had a lot of suffering, but you see, God also kept Aphrodite alive. He was sick unto death, not on the verge of death, and God made him heal. Okay, I sent him therefore the more carefully that when you see me again, you may rejoice that I may be the less sorrowful. So you see, Paul is sending him because why? They can rejoice that he's okay, he's not sick anymore. And this will make Paul happier. Can you imagine the love Paul has? He even wants them to feel good or he's suffering. How many of you feel that way, man? Think carefully, you know, what are you thinking? Do you have selfish desires of yourself or do you think about others? Okay? Receive him there from the Lord with all gladness and hold such reputation. Such in reputation again. Okay? Because of the work of Christ, he was nigh unto death, not regarding his life to supply your lack of service toward me. So you see, they did not serve Paul fully, Aphrodite filled into the thing, and he was nigh unto death, and he sacrificed his life almost, and God kept him alive. Sometimes the way these people do it, they love God so much, they're willing to die. Now I want to share with you a short video, I'm not going to play through the whole video, but I want you to see the part about, look, you know when I saw it, I was thanking God in my heart, I wasn't bouncing up and down, but I was thanking God in my heart. It's such an amazing thing that a church that had been watered down for so many years uh, has come up to the surface again. You know, it's almost God is telling us something. Hit my 
by a Taliban attack. The U.S. military has confirmed on Monday that an F-16 fighter jet was struck by enemy fire in eastern Afghanistan. It's rare that an advanced fighter jet is hit by a Taliban attack. Officials said the multi-million dollar jet has sustained significant damage. It was forced to jettison its fuel tanks and munitions before returning to base. The pilot was unharmed. The Taliban claimed on Twitter that they had downed the jet in eastern Paktia province last Tuesday evening. Most of the province is under its control. U.S. forces say the Taliban had shot down several military helicopters using small arms fire, but never an F-16. The jet is capable of supersonic speeds and reaching heights of 50,000 feet. The U.S. Air Force has lost control of two Predator drones in recent incidents in Turkey and in Iraq. The U.S. military officials said in the first case on October 16 that a Predator crew reported a lost link and a subsequent crash while the drone was flying southeast of the Iraqi capital Baghdad. The second UAV crashed on October 19 in southern Turkey. The cause of the crashes is under investigation. Mr. President, Commander in Chief, my first and most res uh, important responsibility is keeping the American people safe. Uh, and that means that we make sure that our military is properly funded. The bill that's before me, authorizing our uh, defense spending for this year, uh, does a number of good things. It makes sure that uh, our military is funded. It has some important provisions around uh, reform of our military uh, retirement system, uh, which is necessary to make sure that it's stable uh, and effective. Uh, it's got some cybersecurity provisions that are necessary. That's an increasing threat. Uh, unfortunately, it falls woefully short in three areas. It keeps in place a sequester that is inadequate for us to properly fund our military in a stable, sustained way and allows uh, all of our armed forces to plan properly. Unfortunately, it prevents a wide range of reforms that are necessary for us to get our military modernized and uh, able to deal with the many threats that are presenting themselves in the 21st century. And the third thing is that uh, this legislation specifically impedes our ability to close Guantanamo in a way that I have repeatedly argued uh, is counterproductive to uh, our efforts to defeat uh, terrorism uh, around the world. Uh, I'm going to be vetoing uh, this authorization bill. I'm going to be sending it back to Congress, and my message to them is very simple. Uh, let's do this right. There you go. skill unquestioned and he's now regularly being spotted on key battlegrounds in Syria. This picture from Iran's semi-official news agency showing Iranian General Qasem Soleimani seemingly posing with troops in Syria. The latest evidence of Iran's growing involvement with Russia there. Other photos posted on social media have captions which claim Soleimani was in western Syria in recent days, speaking not only to Syrian troops but to fighters from Hezbollah, considered a terror group by the U.S. CNN cannot independently verify the authenticity of these photos or when they were taken. But if Soleimani is in western Syria, experts say it foreshadows danger. It would be another piece of evidence that the Iranians are planning to be heavily involved in what appears to be a planned major offensive in the area. U.S. officials tell CNN there could be more than 2,000 Iranian troops, up to 6,000 Syrians, and more than 2,000 Hezbollah fighters on the ground near Aleppo in an offensive aimed at recapturing that city from anti-Assad forces. It's a dangerous alliance that has Washington worried. It's quite significant. This has been an escalating trend we've seen over the past 
year in particular, as the regime's performance militarily has faltered, the Iranians have stepped in to fill that role and actually have established a strong political and military presence in the country. We have gotten to a stage where essentially these battles are being planned and led on the battlefield by Iranians. Soleimani leads the elite Quds Force of Iran's Revolutionary Guard. He's a shadowy commander with a lot of American blood on his hands from the Iraq War. He uh, spearheaded the effort uh, to build bombs that uh, were very effective killing American forces. These advanced explosive devices. U.S. officials say Soleimani was also involved in a notorious plot on American soil, overseeing Quds Force operatives who, in 2011, tried and failed to assassinate Saudi Arabia's ambassador to the United States at Washington's upscale Cafe Milano. Iran denies involvement. Russian Prime Minister Dmitry Medvedev said on Saturday that it's stupid for the U.S. to refuse to host a Russian delegation on Syria. In his words, Washington just demonstrated their weakness due to such a decision. A surprise from Moscow this morning where embattled Syrian President Bashar al-Assad made a brief visit. He met with Russian President Vladimir Putin, whose military is supporting Assad in the civil war in Syria. This was a lot more than a courtesy call. It was a thanks for everything, and I mean everything call. With Vladimir Putin's jets effectively becoming Bashar al-Assad's air force, the beleaguered Syrian leader smiled like he hadn't smiled in years. The terrorism that is now spreading today could have, without your decisions and actions, spread to even more territories and states, not just in our region, but to other regions too. Two weeks into Russia's surprise military intervention in Syria in the air and on the ground, Mr. Putin promised Mr. Assad continued support. We are prepared to do whatever we can, not only in the course of military efforts to fight terrorism, but also in the course of the political process. That's a process the U.S. would like to see result in Assad's ouster. Today, U.S. officials wonder how the visit will affect upcoming meetings Friday between Secretary of State Kerry and his Russian counterpart, Sergei Lavrov. The White House spokesman telling reporters, quote, we view the red carpet welcome for Assad, who has used chemical weapons against his own people, at odds with the stated goal by the Russians for a political transition in Syria. But Russia's recent military activities may not end in Syria. President Putin reportedly sending a letter to Iraqi Prime Minister al-Abadi expressing his support for the fight against ISIS on the Iraqi side of the border, raising the possibility of Russia filling a perceived void in Iraq left by the U.S. These people in Russia and the Kremlin are going to say, okay, we have an opportunity here. We're going to drive our version of a Mack truck right through this area, and we are going to control the agenda for the northern Middle East. And, and that is exactly what they're doing. The video was shot over the district of Jobar and is considered to be the first imagery that shows the scale of destruction from the air. Jobar is part of the eastern suburb of Damascus, known as the Eastern Gota, which has been held by rebels for years. Thousands of Syrian army airstrikes and barrel bombs have been dropped from army helicopters throughout the country's civil war. Most are in the central and northern parts of Syria, and some are in those eastern suburbs of Damascus. Artillery shells and airstrikes on Jobar shake Damascus practically on a daily basis.
Russian warplanes on the attack in Aleppo. The video cannot be independently verified, but Russian President Vladimir Putin says his country's show of force is sending a message to the world. As a result of the operation, it has been confirmed that Russia is ready to adequately and effectively respond to the terrorist threat and any other threats to our country. NATO has once again voiced concern over Russia's military involvement in Syria. NATO Deputy Secretary General Alexander Rushfeld says since Moscow's objectives in Syria differ from those of the U.S. and its allies, his airstrikes in the Arab country creates the risk of, quote, an incident getting out of control. The Western alliance is angry at the Kremlin for targeting militants fighting against the Syrian President Bashar al-Assad. Moscow's airstrikes in Syria have further sustained its ties, strained its ties, rather, with NATO members. NATO is to launch a massive military exercise on land, sea, and air. The drills mark the biggest test of the alliance's capability since 2002, dubbed Trident Juncture. The drills will begin at an airbase in Sicily and will continue on Italian, Spanish, and Portuguese territory. The three-week live exercise follows a staff training program that began earlier this month. The exercise is to test out a 5,000-strong spearhead force that can deploy in less than a week. Nearly 36,000 soldiers and civilians from nearly 30 countries, including non-NATO member Ukraine, the European Union, and the African Union, are expected to take part in the drones. NATO officials have rejected suggestions that the exercise is directed against Russia. Latvian and German troops took part in a joint military drill at the Adazi training field, Latvia, on Thursday. More than 280 soldiers carried out attack and defense trainings with the participation of the German's infantry fighting vehicle, the Martyr. Latvia currently hosts NATO forces from Germany and the United States. Russia, Latvia's neighbor, has previously condemned the NATO buildup on its western border. Russia plans to station a military unit in the Arctic by 2018. The country's defense minister told Russian media on Thursday that the unit should be up and running by then. He added that a military base with modern equipment has also been built on the Arctic island of Kotelny. Russia has reinforced its presence in the Arctic in recent years. The area is believed to hold huge oil reserves and natural gas deposits. In 2014, the country released its military doctrine, which prioritized the need to protect its interests in the Arctic. Russia also plans to create a network of naval facilities for submarines and warships in the Arctic by the end of the decade. The Iran's army is set to launch large-scale drills in western and northwestern regions. The drills are part of the army's annual exercises to boost military readiness. This drill uh, is about to happen in a day, and it's going to take as long as two days. Behind me, you see uh, the rapid reaction units and artillery units, armored vehicles. They are all positional, uh, also the uh, helicopters that have came just now. Uh, they are in position. The souls. In the long. The sea is not the blood. The, the, now those we saw last time in China, the, the red, the river was red, looks like blood. That's just a foreshadow. It's a warning. But what they're talking about that is the literal. But we're talking about the spiritual level. What's the spiritual level? The souls of people are dying, especially in the Middle East. They're dead. If you go look at the last one year alone, what has happened? The blood that thing, right? ISIS and all this. And by the way, it's not just ISIS. They're also doing it to ISIS themselves. The, the Shiite, Jihadists, uh, all this. It's become blood and the souls have died. That's right. Nobody can enter heaven. You see, do you see the connection? No one can enter heaven. The temple is closed. Now, three. And the third angel poured out its vial upon the rivers and fountains of waters. Now, what is fountains? Holy Spirit. And they became blood. Right? And I heard an angel of the water say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art. And was and shall be in because thou hast judged. Six, for they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they were worthy. Now the question is, these saints and prophets, this may not only be those who worship the beast, but they've also killed others. Those that killed saints and prophets, Christians, Jews over the years, and what has God done? They make blood, shed blood. God gives them blood to drink. Now it's not literal. Huh? It's not literally God gives them blood to drink. It means what? You have to suffer the sight of blood. Look at the Middle East now. Look at them running around. Look at the Yazidi. Look at the Kurds, Prashmurga. 
Look at the beheadings. Look at the way blood is flowing to the ground. That's the blood. Okay, that's the blood. Now, why they say they taste the blood, okay? They drink them blood to drink. Because, you know, like I've ever seen, you know when you see the side of blood for the first time, you feel the, the throat dry, you feel very sick feeling, okay? And I heard another author say, even so, Lord Almighty, true and righteous, but I just feel... And the fourth bow, angel potter is vile upon the sun, and power is given unto him to scorch men with fire. Now, some people say the sun represents the Lord, and they're spiritualizing again. Now, I don't agree with this. I believe the Bible means what it says. I believe sun represents the real sun. Why? Now, we have seen quite a number of videos over the last two years, right? A lot of it about seven vials, solar flares. Okay, maybe solar flares don't increase the heat. But remember the time I showed you the tornado in the sun, where the temperature was, what, about 2 million degrees Celsius or something like that. We showed it last week, the one, the hot key Davis channel. There is increase in the activity of the sun, and it's getting hotter. It's getting hotter, that's why we perspire more. The intensity of the sun is increasing and this has already started. Okay, it started. And that's why it's having dropped. That's why you see the water levels are dropping. You can see the church. Okay. And men were scorched with great heat. Now, if this was metaphor alone, they said men is scorched with great heat. Great heat what? From the gospel. And blaspheme the name of God, which had the power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. Now, some will contend against me. They say, how can you prove what you say is true? We don't see people criticizing God because of the heat. They do. They do. When the Europeans were dying because of the heat, or those in Pakistan, they were basically criticizing God. Go listen to the videos. They're criticizing God. But they were not criticizing the God they believe. They were cursing Christians, actually, basically. The God of the Bible. So that's why I tell you something. Uh, there, uh, so this kind of thing that's happening now, now the fifth angel powder is vile upon the seed of the beast, the seed of the beast, the key. And his kingdom was full of darkness. And they gnaw their tongues in pain. And blaspheme the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and repent all their deeds. Now this is still to come. Number five is coming. Why? Because the skies will go dark. Remember the Bible says the skies will go dark. And the moon will not give off its light. So it will be darkness. Darkness across the land. Okay. And you know why they were blaspheming God? Can you imagine you have sores, you've been scorched with the sun, and then suddenly you have darkness upon you. Okay, now let's go to six. And the sixth angel powder is vile with the great trigger of Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up. For that the way the e kings of the east might be prepared. Now, I told you all this before. They all said the kings of the east is China. That's why you see all these videos are focusing on China, Japan, India. Wrong. It's not China, it's not Japan, it's not India. The kings of the east is east of Jerusalem. If you look at the Bible, east of Jerusalem, the map, is Iran. It's Jordan. It's Pakistan, Afghanistan, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, and all those who worship Satan. So the point is that all basically that's east of Israel. Okay? So who's going to attack? You know who. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of dragon, Satan, and out of the mouth of the beast, Allah, and out of the mouth of the false prophet Muhammad. For they were the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. This is where Maybe some people have got it all wrong. It's not just them. They're gathering the whole world right now. They're gathering the whole world. But of course, they do not know they're doing God's will. You see? Now, you see all the lies. Now, why is it the Bible is like... You see, sorry, why is it the Bible talks about these lies? Let me explain number one. They claim that Israel is beating the poor Palestinians down. So, it's bringing a lot of people against Israel. More too. Okay, and the whole thing is basically gathering against Israel. So, it's all the lies. Now, why is it lies? Because Satan hates the people of Israel. He hates the Jews. He hates the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Secondly, what are the lies are saying? They're claiming that the Jews are praying on Temple Mount. They're not. And this is gathering the whole forces towards it, no? the direction of Israel. That's why now you can see Russia is in the Middle East. You can see all the countries and all the nations are pouring in. It's gone to mentally gone. Now, next. 
For this one, I want you all to know, verse 15, keep it to heart and never forget. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. You know something? I told this to you all last year. I tell it to you all again. Jesus is so wonderful. He's so tremendously loving. He's actually told you all a clue. You know, when I first found this out, I found this out many years ago. Long before I met Deborah and Joshua, I found this out. And then I told the Bible study long ago. Do you know that this is when Jesus returns? You know, he's warning. When you start seeing troops in the Middle East moving, he says, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed he is. That means what he's saying, I'm coming soon. You got it? That is the biggest clue. That's why the clowns who come out of dispensationalism are all wrong. So when we see countries coming to the Middle East to fight, you see everybody moving in. Now America is sending back troops into the Middle East. You notice everybody is sending what, troops into the Middle East now? Soon China will send in troops. What are you going to do? The whole world is going to be gathering in. Okay. By the way, why do they call it the Great Day of God Almighty? Because that is Armageddon. Remember the valley of Jehoshaphat, the valley of decision. Beautiful, isn't it? And he gathered to them together a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. Now Armageddon is the Greek. In the Hebrew tongue is called Megiddo or Ha Megiddo or Megiddo. Okay, the seven vial, the seven angel poured out his vial in the air, and it came great voice out of the temple heavens, throne saying, It is done. That means it's over. This goes back to Revelation chapter 10, verse 5 and 6. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake such as not since men were upon the earth, uh, so mighty an earthquake and so great. And the great city, Jerusalem, was divided into three parts, Christian, Jews, Muslim. And the cities of the nations fell. Notice the cities of the nations fell. That means, right, the earthquake is going to be so bad. You all will know when Jesus has returned. You know, you will see buildings like that tall building over down there, you're going to see buildings collapsing, you know. Of course, in those days, I don't stand, don't go to such buildings. We can't wish you know, to that. If you know Jesus is coming, you should go to somewhere, pre pray, and wait for him to come. Don't go down there to MBS hoping to get one last kill or whatever. The building collapse, you die with it. Okay? Now, and the great city was divided, right, into three parts, and the cities and nations fell. Great Babylon, Saudi Arabia came to remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of his fierceness of his wrath. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not bound. And there fell upon a man a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceedingly great. And that's it. And then that's it. The whole world ends. And that's when they burn. By the way, the hail is very big. And you know that the Bible says, uh, at the end of the age, it will be burning them. I can show you, it's in Matthew chapter 13. But the point is that, I will do this next week in more detail. They will just be burnt, totally burnt, scorched, destroyed. And we are coming close to it, very close to it. But it's very sad. It's very sad. Because not everyone's ready and not everyone's prepared to see the Lord. But we must still try. I wanted to invite two people this week, but both the opportunity did not present itself. I'm going to try next week. In fact, I'm going to try next week five. But I couldn't try and push it one last time. Okay? So in the meantime, let's um, look at Matthew 26, 26, page 460. I mean, 640. 640, okay? And they were still eating. Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take it, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. But this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. You see, when the concept of blood in the Bible, right, it's a spiritual concept, okay, the cleansing. But when they said that God gives them blood to drink, you've got to understand it's not literal. You cannot take it as a literal sign there. Okay, but at the same time, you cannot spiritualize it all the way. There's a significance, a spiritual significance. But we cannot go and say that it just means nothing. The point is that it really does mean something. Why? Because blood's been shed upon. So that means there's a lot of bloodletting. And remember they said, right, the sin is when you take the blood out of something. It's in Levitical law. So now let's go to the doxology. We've not done Jude, the one in Jude for a long time. Okay. 
Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and forever. Amen. Let's say a prayer. Let's say. Dear Heavenly Father, we have come close to the hour. Please help us, dear Lord, to prepare ourselves spiritually and mentally for the dark times ahead. We know we will be present in the time of the end. It's going to be a very, very dark time. In fact, we are almost there. We can see the number of people dying, the floods, and you can see the whole world is moving towards Armageddon. But it's a so wonderful thing to see actually a church emerging from water after all these years. It is really a great feeling. It's quite ironic that while the visible churches are being burned, destroyed, that a symbol of a church that has been abandoned 400 years ago has surfaced. Heavenly Father, please help us to move righteously before the end. And please help us, the Lord, to worship you in spirit and truth each and every day of our lives. In Jesus' name, Amen. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. I enjoyed the last